Now we're picking up with the 4.3 section of chapter four, where we're gonna be talking about taxation. But before we talk about taxation, let's introduce one last market failure, the issue of inequity. Now, inequity refers to an unfairness of some kind. Normally, we think about unfairness in the sense of some people don't get enough income and it's unfair that they can't afford X, Y, or Z. The goods that they cannot afford, we usually refer to as merit goods because merit goods are goods that society believes everyone's entitled to some minimum quantity of those particular goods. We could think of food, you know, a certain amount of food that you need, a certain amount of medical care that you need, or some other good for which it's unfair if somebody cannot afford it. So clearly the government steps in using taxation to transfer money in one way or another, either directly as a transfer payment, which would mean a cash payment to somebody that they could use to spend themselves on some particular good, or the government could provide the good directly. Like we provide public schools for young people, even if their parents cannot afford it, we believe schools are merit good and everyone should have some amount of it irrespective of their income. And so the government steps in to provide those goods. Now, of course, this has caused a great deal of growth in the government, as you can imagine. Uh, since 1900, we've seen the government grow um, 10 times in the number of employees it's had, it has, and uh, the budget has grown 6,000 times since 1900. All of this, of course, happening in a democratic society, so people are voting for the government doing more and more and more. In this particular graph, we can actually see a um, chart of the different levels of government spending. Normally, we break down the total government into federal government and then state and local government separately. So in this particular graph, you can see the orange line is the federal government spending. The blue line is the state and local government spending. You add the two together and you hit the green line and the green line would be the total government spending. Now, in this particular example, we have to be careful. This is not total spending of all monies. It's total spending on government purchases which means the government hires a worker, the government buy, buys a fire truck, the government builds a public hospital, where the government is literally spending money on a good or a service. Now, a big chunk of what the government does today is called a transfer payment, which we will spend more time on later, where the government does not actually buy anything, instead it sends a check to someone and lets them buy it for themselves. So, this is only the government purchases of goods and services. And we're not measuring these in dollars. You'll notice on the um, y-axis, we're measuring in percentage of the total GDP. So we can see that at one time, federal spending was a very small part of the total economy, under two or 3%. And even then, um, in the 1930s, state and local still spent a pretty good bit. We're talking about somewhere around 8% of the total economy was spent by a, a state or local government. That would be what building roads, um, schools, hiring teachers, firemen, police officers, those kinds of things would, would be in, in the blue line. You take the orange line, add it to the blue line, then you end up with the green line. So the green line, again, measuring as a percentage of the economy, you can see that starting in the 1930s, federal spending starts to rise as a percentage of the economy, state and local declines to the 1940s, during this time period, everyone knows the 1940s is a time period of World War, so we can see federal spending skyrockets as a percentage of the economy, almost reaching half, the, half of the entire U.S. economy was being processed through the government to fight the war. And then, of course, when the war ends, that percentage drops dramatically down to around 5%. But over time, you can see it bobbles around. Federal purchases uh, hit their peak somewhere in the 19, uh, other than wartime. In the 1950s, there's another war going on. This is the Korean War. So federal expenditures, again, skyrocket. You can see state and local spending in the 1950s all the way through the 1970s has been rising as a percentage of the economy from somewhere around 5% up to around 13% of the total economy. And then from that point on, federal uh, local state local spending seems to have stabilized at that level with a slight bump up to 15% and then a slight decline so over time, since the 1970s, state and local government spending has been roughly constant. The federal spending percentage kind of bubbled up and down, up and down, but ended up being approximately constant over that time period, 
giving a total government purchases as a percentage of the economy, um, hit its peak from the 1950s up through the 1990s, and then since the 1990s, it declined to the 2000s, and then from the 2000s upward, you can see here, uh, this is 2006, 2007, 2008, this huge spike. This has all been um, due to government spending dealing with the huge recession, the Great Recession that happened in those years, and then um, government spending as a percentage of the economy de declined. Now, again, remember, these are only government purchases, actually hiring workers and purchasing equipment to operate a government. This is not counting issues dealing with uh, transfer payments. Now, each level of the government, the federal, state, and the local creates a budget of funds, inflow, and an outflow. The inflow, of course, is the source of funds. Where does the government get its money? From two main sources, either taxes or borrowing. Now, of course, within taxes, we're also including, including user fees. That would be something like um, if you ever jump on the uh, quote unquote Lexus lanes on the interstate where you have to be, you have to use your peach pass and you have to pay to use that particular lane, that would be an example of a user fee. Most of us are familiar with regular taxes, you know, sales taxes, property taxes, income taxes, or the government can borrow. Outflows would be what are they using the funds for? They can purchase goods and services. They can make payments for re resources used. And then, of course, transfer payments, things like Social Security, where the government does not actually buy food um, for old people. What they do instead is they just send you a Social Security check and then you go buy your own food. Now, let's take a look at the growth of the government. The federal government growth, as you can see, um, primarily rose um, uh, rather rose more slowly than the private sector from 1950 to 2008, which means the government was growing, but the private economy was growing so much more rapidly that as a percentage of the entire economy, government spending, uh, government expenditures on goods and services were declining. Uh, most of the growth in federal spending has been from increased transfer payments, such as social security payments, things like that. That's been the main growth um, in the United States for the federal level. At the state and local level, state and local governments buy a lot more output than the federal government does because the federal government mostly buys what? Military goods and then what? National Park Service Rangers and a few other people. The federal government is nowhere near as large as all 50 state governments combined because they're providing what? K through 12 education, roads and a whole bunch of other things. So state and local government is much larger in total when you put all 50 states together than is the federal government. Now let's talk about taxation, which is supposed to be the main focus of this particular uh, set of lectures. Now, of course, um, tax revenue pays for most of government spending. Uh, uh, there's a change in the output mix as more government spending absorbs factors of production that could be used to produce consumer goods. This is just a fancy way of saying, it's pretty, it should be pretty obvious to you, that if you were thinking of buying yourself a nice fancy Mercedes because you have no taxes and therefore you have all your income, you have enough money to buy the Mercedes, if the government now puts a tax of 30% on your income, your income drops low enough that you can no longer afford the Mercedes. Instead, you're going to buy um, a Nissan. Okay. So the whole point of this is that government taxation changes the kind of things that the private market does because people's income obviously changes after they pay their taxes. The opportunity cost of taxation, what does that mean? Remember, everything has a cost, and that's the opportunity cost. What are the things given up whenever you make a choice? So whenever we have taxation and the government chooses, let's say, to ship a whole bunch of missiles over to Ukraine so the Ukrainians can continue fighting the war, then obviously those resources have to come from somewhere because those you know, missiles are made of steel and there's a whole bunch of um, labor, a lot of it very high tech labor, engineers have to be working on those programs they can't simultaneously be working on a private sector program. So the opportunity cost of taxation is measured by what private sector activity or output has to be sacrificed if the government is going to take those resources and use them for some other purpose. Now, as long as the government is using it for a purpose more valuable than what we sacrifice, then we would normally say that's a good thing. But of course, if the government is using it to do things that are of lower value, then the sacrifice that has to be made, then of course that's squandering resources. 
Now let's take a look at the federal taxes themselves. We're not going to look at the state and local for now. We're just going to look at federal. As you can see from this pie chart, the um, individual income tax is 50% of all the government revenue, uh, rather government taxes, come from the individual income tax. And then the Social Security tax makes up 35%. So between the two of them, between income tax and Social Security tax, that's 85% of all taxes paid at the federal level. Uh, corporate income taxes make up only 7% because it turns out that corporate income is dramatically smaller than is individual income. So you would expect that corporate taxes, even if the rate is the same, you would expect to collect less dollars of taxes because there's a smaller amount of income being taxed. And then last but not least, all other taxes that would be excise taxes, custom duties, estate and gift taxes, and other miscellaneous taxes all together add up to about 8% of the total collected by the federal government. Now, the income taxes, take a look at this since it's the largest tax collected by government in total dollars, I mean. Uh, the federal income tax is a progressive tax. And a progressive tax means that as your income tax rises, the tax rate also rises. Now, with a proportional tax, as your income tax as your income rises, the tax rate remains the same, and the tax rate doesn't go up. But with a progressive tax, the tax rate itself goes up. So, in other words, taxes paid to the government rise more rapidly than income rises. So, if income rises at 10%, if you're going to raise the tax rate on that, then the government might collect 20% more even though income has only risen 10%. Now, compared to those with lower incomes, those with higher incomes both pay more taxes and they pay at a higher rate, so they pay a higher fraction of their income in taxes. The Social Security tax is a regressive tax. What this means is as income rises, tax rates fall. It turns out with Social Security, once your income goes above, I think it's 96,000, but we could check. I mean, the, the, the dollar amount is not important. I'm not gonna test you on that. But above a certain amount, you no longer pay any further Social Security tax. So if you make a mil half a million dollars a year, you only pay Social Security tax on the taxable portion, which would be the first 96,000. So obviously, if you were making $500,000, your Social Security tax as a percentage of your entire $500,000 income would be lower than would a worker who is only making up to the 96,000. For them, they pay the, uh, the Social Security tax on everything that they earn. But of course, the Social Security payments are also regressive. Rich people don't get it um, as a percentage of their income. Their Social, Security their Social Security payment is also smaller. Not the dollar amount. Let's assume that uh, a, uh, a plumber gets a $2,000 of Social Security check and a high-flying lawyer gets a Social Security check of $2,000 when they are retired. $2,000 is a much higher percentage of what the plumber's income had been when they were working than would $2,000 check for a you know, multimillionaire lawyer. It would only be a pittance compared to their total income. So the Social Security tax might be regressive, but so are the um, payments by Social Security. Corporate taxes are a progressive tax rate. Uh, as, your high, as, you, as, a ta as a corporation earns more money, it gets into a higher tax bracket. Um, excise taxes are usually fixed as a percentage uh, on a good or a service, like the tax you pay on when you get a new um, tire. When you buy a tire, not only do you pay for the tire, but you also pay, there's a certain road tax or whatever that the government charges you on your tires. Property taxes, as you all know, uh, if you own a house or a condo or any you know, physical structure, then you pay a property tax. And that tax is regressive since uh, richer people spend a smaller percentage of their income on housing than do poorer people. Then the same size tax, the same percentage tax, will actually be a smaller amount of the total income of a rich person than a poor person. And of course, the same thing is true for sales taxes. 